It's 6 o'clock in London, it's 1pm in New York, 1am in Hong Kong, 3am in Sydney. Hope you're managing to get some sleep in New South Wales. 3am in Sydney is 10am in San Francisco and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO vid live stream series 3, episode 2, number 14, starts here. From South Bend to the South China Sea, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, obviously someone who's a passionate instrument of the political elite here in Malta, from which we're narrow casting today. Mayor Pete, of course, was one of the candidates to be the Democratic president of the United States of America, or at least the nominee therein. Well, Joe Biden may be picking him as the future ambassador to China for the United States of America. And therefore, it may even be the case that the United States election is over, even if these statistical anomalies look like the stuff of, well, cephalogical PhDs for years to come. Meanwhile, in the market space, there's been a lot of talk about the Nasdaq proposals to nudge the boards of publicly listed companies on the Nasdaq towards greater diversity. Thanks to everybody who's been engaging with my inbox during the course of the past week. And where was that inbox? Why? Well, of course, it was in Exchange Invest, the unique daily bulletin of the bourse business. If you don't know about that, well, check out exchangeinvest.com. Come along, take a 30-day free trial and learn all about the business of bourses and our unique conversational style of daily newsletters. Indeed, back in the Exchange Parish, I was pleased to see a sensible discourse, as opposed to the frankly bizarre, come some might say bigoted. It's an attack on white males, hysteria by some frankly idiots in the often, well, curiously incurious US media. Other nuanced arguments have legs about this proposal, and I maintain a concern about privacy issues, where I believe NASDAQ will be cautious or so they're attempting to assure the market. And of course, this is not a mandated diversity rule, but a suggested data point for the future with which companies have several years to comply. However, at the same time, two distinct canards stink out in the argument against the Nasdaq proposal. Both of these came close to, frankly, triggering, ladies and gentlemen, my egalitarian resolve to say something more excited than surely not. Point one. Some might argue there is an insufficient talent pool of minorities to be non-executive directors. Well, any non-executive directors or media folk saying this sort of thing, frankly, in my opinion, fail the fit and proper tests on the grounds of having zero societal awareness. I could name 100 plus exchange invest readers off the top of my head alone who would make excellent non-executive directors and in many cases do, with the sole exception of lacking a Ruthenian. I think that the readership covers just about every element of Earth's richly diverse population. A second point that's been made is that it's not the role of exchanges to be out there attempting to change society. What a load of utter cobblers, ladies and gentlemen. The question ought to be, how can an exchange shirk their responsibility in the 21st century as a self-regulatory organisation and avoid seeking to make markets better without attempting proactive engagement with the public and all of the stakeholders? Cowering behind a veil of silence, fretting about upsetting some counterparty or another was the worst spineless element of the club exchange era. And it's still been evident in too many places in modern times. So bravo Nasdaq for taking this stand. Even if we don't agree with any exchange's proposal, whether it's on IPO Vid Live or on exchangeinvest.com, we must support the right of an exchange to make a stand. It's the only way to gradually reduce the spineless from within the parish. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, Sharon Constanson, may just have a thing or two to say about not merely corporate governance, but also that of minority equality. And indeed, at this point in time, I've got to offer an apology. 14 shows in, and we've only got our first female guest. I am really, 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 really sorry. We will make it up in the new year. We've got some very exciting female guests already on the slate, and we're going to try and represent the whole of the world's population before next year is out. Sharon comes to us from the UK today. She is the chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce in the UK. She delivers high-level board evaluations, mentoring and training through her companies, which are called, let's face it, 
the perfect description of the feminine while in their presence as a directorial initiative on board. Genius. The Genius Companies were something that came out of Sharon's extensive experience. She cut her teeth running Forex Treasury Management Companies. She's an active figure in the City of London, and she recently organized an absolutely magnificent film showing. It was a virtual evening coming to us live from, in many ways, the epicenter of jurisprudence. The wonderful Old Bailey courtrooms of the City of London, and that was a documentary devoted to the historic Ravonia trial in South Africa. The title of that documentary was Life is Wonderful, and ladies and gentlemen, all I can say is you've got to see it. Sharon, welcome. You are live on IPO Vid. Where in the world are you today? I'm in South Buckinghamshire in England, um, just north of the Thames, and in the in the darkness, in the Chiltern Hills, in the beech trees. In the, the peach trees in the Chiltern beach. Hills? Beach. The beach, beach trees. Beach. Now, this one's very exciting, beech trees. I mean, tell us a little bit about the, the estate that's surrounding you, because I sense this is more than a, a, a two-bedroom, one-up, two-down, <laughs> somewhere in, in the middle. But the mention of South Buckinghamshire, you, you usually get a bit of space, right? Got a little bit of space, 10 acres in amongst the trees. Uh, you can go down the local lane. You wouldn't even know the house is here. It's well hidden. And it is the original home of Dylan Knox, who was a code breaker during the war. And he had a little cottage here, which predecessors between myself and himself have extended the house somewhat. I've done my little share of that as well. And it's now a reasonably spacious 115-year-old, 118-year-old home. How fantastic. And mention of Dylan Knox and the great code breakers of the Enigma era. Quite fascinating because you are, it has to be said, somewhat of an enigma yourself in business. And as I mentioned that, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, you're watching us live. You're coming to us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Ask a question, make a comment, anything you'd like to ask Sharon or talk about the show, you are able to talk to us right now. Just drop a comment in the area somewhere to the right or below where you're watching this screen. We'll be delighted to include you within the conversation. So Sharon, tell us a little bit about yourself. You were born in South Africa. Yes, I was born in Cape Town of English parents who had found each other out there and moved, in, moved to Johannesburg in my later school years and most of my career um, up until just after 2000 was in Johannesburg, traveling the country for business, and uh, then came to the UK in 2002, uh, mainly due to a security incident in South Africa, and that brought me home, um, much to my father's relief, um, because the country has been through its various stages of security complexity, is probably a nice way of describing it. So that's, that's, that's the personal side. Um, any further questions that I'll go into any other bits you're interested in. Well, let's take a step back for a moment, because when you were growing up as a child, what was the personal security situation like then? Oh, so different to what it is today. Uh, we used to be in a situation where, you know, go out and play and come home when, the, when it's dark. And our parents had no idea where we were, what we were doing. Uh, we didn't have mobile phones. You had no way of connecting to each other. We just went off as kids. Um, it was just so different to what it is now. And yes, there were unsavory characters around in those days, but we were taught to handle it, and we did. Uh, so we had a much freer life, I think, than people do today and a far more outdoor life than people do today uh, in the environment that we lived in. Um, and also, I lived in... A, a, a time in South Africa where part of the apartheid rules hadn't come in in the local area. So we had uh, people of all ethnicities living in the same space. It was quite different. Only then did the uh, apartheid era reach the part that I lived in. That was, of course, a, a very black hour for South Africa. And you were therefore, you were living in or around Cape Town, is that right? Yes, a southern suburbs of Cape, Cape Town, which was sort of in the lee of the back of Table Mountain. So, um, and schooling was close by, you went by bus as a five-year-old, you caught the bus. Uh, that's what one did. Uh, by eight years old, you rode your bicycle to school, and it was probably equivalent to five miles away. It's, it's a, no, actually probably more than five miles away, and you found your own way to school. So the engagement of your parents in your lives growing up at that age was very, very different to what parents do today, engaging with their children. 
So you were the eldest of four kids and you did pretty well at school, but ultimately your family didn't quite see the idea of you becoming the thrusting career woman, at least in the very <laughs> early ages. Is that fair? Yes, they, they believed that a secretarial training, as in typist secretarial, was the best a woman was entitled to. And then they needed to get married to somebody that worked in the office and then look after the home, bring up the family and do what was expected of women. And this is, even though I had English parents and not a sort of local Afrikaans environment or a, um, uh, it, was, yeah, it was just that was what was expected of you. That's how they thought. It's quite incredible to think how, how much things have changed in such a short period of time. And I'm sure a lot of, I mean, a lot of a lot of viewers tonight would be instantly triggered by the idea that parents would have suggested secretarial college was as good as a young girl could possibly expect. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's incredible how it has changed. And youngsters growing up today, uh, born in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, they know they have an equal chance to do whatever it is they want to do. That is a given. That is the way they expect it to be. And they don't think of it ever being any different. Whereas in the time when I was uh, growing up and going to work, uh, the idea of a woman taking on a career um, outside of being a secretary was just unheard of. Uh, maybe teaching, nursing, uh, those were the other two that were quite typical. But invariably, um, for example, teachers in those days, you couldn't teach if you were married. You could only teach as a single person, a no, single woman, sorry. Men could, uh, but women couldn't. You had to give up your career as soon as you got married. Quite incredible. So therefore, you went down the secretarial line, but you very quickly started moving on. So explain, how did you do that? I started working at JCI, which is a large mining house in South Africa, as a secretary. And I think it took me two weeks. I think I was the, the 14th, 15th of January, having started at the beginning of the month. I thought, I'm going to have to study. I'm not staying in this job for anything forever. I'm going to have to find a way to get out of it. And the only way I could think of was to study. So I wrote my first exams in the May, and that was the beginning of three years of becoming a company secretary. Fantastic. So you became a company secretary. And how did that then progress your career forward? Uh, in the process of doing that, I moved from being a secretary to being a company secretary in the same department, then moving to being in the company secretarial department of the mining house, and then thought, no, the secretarial part of it, which is a fairly far more administrative in those days than what company secretarial and board support might be today. And then thought I'd, I'd rather have a look at the finance side of the education, and we had a very strong finance side to our education. In those days, it's much, it's different today. But of course, it's not quite the same. So it's it's modernised in a lot of ways. But the one thing we did get in those days was a fantastic uh, financial education. So I moved to work for the Blue Circle Group, the cement company, and <clears throat> at a very young age of 20, joined them and then um, got involved in uh, doing their finance and then foreign exchange. And that then took me to working with Société Générale um, as a chief dealer eventually. Actually, no, pretty quickly, not eventually, pretty quickly I was their chief dealer, foreign exchange um, chief dealer. So in foreign exchange chief dealing, now that must have been quite a challenge at the time because weren't there issues with the South African rand being controlled and how you could actually deal? It was actually a very interesting time going through uh, the foreign exchange world from the early 80s through right the way through the financial round coming back in 1985 and the dual currency returning and exchange controls returning to a much stronger degree than had been there at that time and seeing the rand fall through parity in 1985 and come down to the levels we're down to now. Uh, so it was a very, very interesting time to be in commerce with those kind of activities happening in, in the sort of mid 80s. So a very, very interesting time. I actually traveled for the bank uh, in 85, just before we had our, we had the 2008 um, global crash. Well, South Africa had their crash in uh, August 85. And I traveled to the UK and Europe for the bank just before that and came back. And these are the days before you sort of sent an email or even a post, an uh, airmail, and came back after my six weeks trip and said, there's something wrong. The South African currency uh, or market is at risk. There's a liquidity problem. I don't understand it, but these are the questions I was asked. And we took some uh, strategic decisions as a bank to try and protect the bank if I were right. I just think I was 25 years old. And the crash came. Uh, this was in the third week of June. 
and the crash came the th fourth week of August. And it did impact the entire market. The Reserve Bank had to support the, the, the market, they had to come in and protect the bank and to keep the market liquid. And three days later before we reopened the market again. So it was a very, very fascinating times, um, very interesting to live through and to have to deal with the customer and try and explain what had happened in those three days when the market had closed and how it had reopened and what, what did it mean to them as a corporate? Yes, I mean, servicing a client in those sorts of markets is incredibly difficult when they just simply can't do a deal. I'm not even sure they can get away with that in this day and age. Someone would have found a proxy to manage to work their way around it. No, the market just literally shut down. They cleared everything, got everything sorted, got the monies to where it all belonged so that it didn't have a domino effect of crashing everybody, got the monies to where it was and reopened with the, the liquidity back intact, which I thought was probably a strategically clever, clever action. The um, issues then was to deal with what had caused it, uh, understanding the, the true underlying issues that had been there, what the actions had been. And it, with that came in the beginning of the sort of more regulated markets we are totally familiar with now. In those days, we didn't have that degree of regulation at all. So that drove you into becoming very customer centric in the foreign exchange world. Yes, uh, I had been at a corporate and expected the bank to understand what I wanted and what I needed and what was important to me. The other part of me had now been in the bank, um, assuming I could deliver that service to the individual companies that I serviced and realized you can't because companies are multi-banked. You can't get to know everything you need to know. And I promised myself only five years in banking. I'm a more corporate commercial person. And after the five years, went back, went out of the banking world and started my own business, which was to sit between the corporates and the banks and deliver the service that the, co co the corporates needed as being their corporate treasurer for foreign exchange purposes and be able to work with the series of banks that they had credit lines with and to get further credit lines, better service, whatever was needed. So that was, yes, in the late 80s that I started that business. And today we would call that outsourcing. Um, that, that those words didn't exist in those days, but we started to use it for in the, in the 90s um, and ultimately took that company to a listing uh, nine years later. So you took that company to a listing, which was absolutely, I mean, a huge success for you. But in fact, you'd already made quite an impact on the South African business world. I mean, you were rated, I think, one of the most exciting figures for the 90s in business. <laughs> Is that correct? Uh, there was a publication that came out on the 31st of December, uh, 1989, with a beautiful photograph of F.W. de Klerk. He was the, the gentleman who was going to save the nation, which he did between him and Mandela. They absolutely did save the nation. And there were a couple of little sort of mug shots of a whole bunch of people from sporting to business to uh, political, you name it. There was this, this series of photographs. And I got a phone call from a family member to say, you're in the newspaper and grabbed the newspaper. In those days, they used to throw it over the wall and went to go and fetch it on the driveway, opened up, and there was this photograph. And here I am being the faces that will change the 90s. I have no idea how or why I got there, but it's been, it's been wonderfully useful for me. And yes, we did do a lot for the currency in the 90s. There were a couple of occasions where we had some very large foreign exchange deals that had to be transacted for clients that could have absolutely dragged the rand down uh, tremendously at that point in time. And my view is to all stakeholders, you have to look after the interests of all parties. So this was the Reserve Bank, the value of the rand, the customer, and making sure that all of that happened in an ethical way. And the, new, the news for days were saying the RAND's going to fall. This is the largest external flow of funds that the country's going to have to sustain. And we did it so quietly uh, and so gently that the client won, the Reserve Bank won, the RAND didn't, did not move at all. So by the time the bank realized it had been done, uh, there was no, no risk to the currency, which was fantastic. It's one of my coup moments of the late 90s, middle, middle 90s. That's going to be something that certainly kept your client incredibly happy at that point in time. And oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. In the, the multiple you were able to get. So you, you listed your company on Johannesburg, on the JSE, yes? Yes, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange in 97. 97. How, how was that experience? Uh, I mean, I look at it, I think, do I, would I do it again? It was very positive. It was extremely stressful. It was 
dealing in something that I knew so little about. And the expectations that today, being so much older, so much more experienced of governance and of markets, I think I'd handle it so much better today than I probably was able to then. But it was fast moving. Um, there was a team, we had a board of directors suddenly. You know, things just matured very, very fast. And the part that I suppose I found difficult to accept was from having been able to make my own decisions, because I effectively owned the company, to now not being able to make any decisions without the board being involved. And the other part being is the board having decisions of their desire that I didn't agree with. And so it was very, very challenging and also to understand the influence the investor has on the business. And now, of course, living in a corporate governance world that I do today, I totally get that. But that was a major transition from being literally the sole shareholder just about to um, actually having no control of the decisions and the future of the company because of all these other stakeholder interests. And that was a, a big learning and a big um Understanding. So when I work with boards today, it, it's I can get some of the issues that they sometimes deal with at a board level is to go, what right have they got to interfere? And I really did feel that in those days. Fascinating. Well, I'm just going to interfere with the flow of the discussion right at this point in time, because actually, ladies and gentlemen, we've hit a benchmark for the year. It's a very exciting moment. We just passed through the 1,000th minute of content on this channel for 2020. So. If you've managed to be here with us for all of the 1,000 minutes, apart from anything else, let's say a fond farewell in 2020 to my great co-star, Toby the Pug, who is sitting <laughs> over my shoulder here. Of course, he was the man who made so many of the early IPO vid narrowcasts that we were doing during the course of the year before we launched ourselves into live stream heaven. If you're enjoying what's going on, do us a favor, ladies and gentlemen, in the words of the youth of today, smash that like button if you would be so kind we need all of the help we can get in order to make sure that the issues we're talking about today in the future and indeed in the past are seen by as many people as possible to which end if you want to ask us a question go ahead drop something into the question box around about where you're watching this particular live stream this evening and ask Sharon something about her fascinating career a woman who was rated even when she was well barely a slip of a thing if you let me say so <laughs> a very very young executive she was already being rated alongside the likes of not just F.W. de Klerk, but future presidents such as Tabu Mbeki and Cyril Ramaphosa as one of the people who helped shape the 1990s, as indeed it turned out with her limited company, which was dealing in the foreign exchange marketplace. Now, if I think about that for a second, Sharon, I mean, you took this company, you've mentioned a couple of times here, this was really the first time you were in full on combat with the whole concept of a cadre of non-executive directors. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me, you know, allowing me to have a little bit of masculine intuition here, sounds to me like your first board wasn't really kind of your dream board. I mean, if you <laughs> the palace you wouldn't have kissed a lot of them and hope they turned into ravishing princes or whatever one hopes for from board members yeah uh, they were a a, a a pulling together of two groups of, of of board directors one group was highly intelligent well experienced um pale male and stale they fitted into that category but very experienced in in their role and then we had the black empowerment um, effort uh, that South Africa had gone through already by then and you had to have a certain number of people that were of color talking to what you're talking about black uh, investors so in the process of going through the IPO we did get some um, uh, what do you call black empowerment funds that had got involved in the business and because these people were stretched very very broadly over a number of huge number of investments in each of these cases the ability to get their knowledge or to get their time didn't happen to the degree that today's governance would expect you to to deliver so we ended up with a board that most of the time you had a 60 percent um, attendance with the other few directors not making it so I didn't get to know some of my directors. And if I have to look at the pale male and stale that I had, there was some good knowledge, but there wasn't knowledge of the business. And we talk about having to have knowledge of a business. You can't have the people that are all external 
with the independent voice and business experience, but not necessarily having some experience about the actual market or the business itself. So that was my biggest frustration is not having anybody on my board who understood what the business actually did. Interesting. And so therefore, when you look at that, and I mean, talking about the broader sort of composition of board issues, because that's something you've become very involved in over time. How do you actually arrive at your ideal board? I mean, is it like fantasy football? You start picking <laughs> people off a list and hope that you're going to manage to sign that person as left back director, or how, how does it work? Uh, it is a bit like a puzzle. Uh, if, you, if you can imagine a puzzle, paint by numbers, you know, those kind of things where you put the component parts together and hopefully you see a pretty picture, the desired picture at the end of the exercise. I think the most important thing is we talk about diversity, which you started about earlier this, uh, this evening, actually. Uh, you do need diversity. You don't want everybody of the same kind because then you're not going to get debate and you're not going to get added value into the conversation. Uh, and it's um, broadening out the conversation and the options and the, and the opportunities that might exist. So I think you need to look at who's going to try, who's going to test you, who's going to support you, who's going to be the grit in your oyster, you know, who, who's going to be the one who's going to scan the horizon and see the risks, who's going to have the industry knowledge and their know-how, the networks, the content. How do you put all those bits together? And when you've got that aspect of content, um, then I think you can start saying, well, do I want male? Do I want female? I've got three of them. How do they all fit in? I think to a degree, things like psychometric testing will help make sure you don't end up with a combative environment that's going to be a negative diversity that's not going to work. So it's important that it is um, something that creates cohesion and will allow to come to a common point which is strategically um, suitable to the company, but you've got to come from different perspectives. So there does need to be alignment of some kind between the people that you're bringing on. And the question is, how many? Why do you want them? What do you? Are they affordable? Uh, what are you going to expect them to bring to the business? Now, obviously, the bigger the company, the more you've got committees that need to be chaired, committees that need attendance, bigger decisions that need they need to get involved in and to delve into in the company. When you're starting with a small company, you're probably looking at one or two non-executive directors. By the time you get up to a FTSE 350 level or FTSE 100, you could be up to seven independent directors. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's interesting. We'll get back to board size a bit more about it in a moment, but actually we've got a couple of questions have come in. So first of all, interesting question just arrived to us via email. How did you expand your risk understanding? Because you've talked about this acute understanding of, say, the 1985 crisis in Forex, and you can see coming from the from the random. Well, all business is risk in many ways. Mm -hmm. How did you expand that risk understanding from going from the relatively short-term often fixation of the Forex markets into the, how might one politely put it, slightly slower, longer-term basis of business? Very interesting question, actually. Um, I think some people have got antennae for risk and they can sense risk better than other people can. If you look at some people who are, uh, we often see it in professions where they might be, um, and I'm, I no disrespect to any number crunches around me, very intelligent people, they might not see risk in the same way I might. I might look at the horizon and think, actually between here and there, there's possibly an iceberg or a submarine they're going to say, well, I can't see anything in between, so I'll go back to my numbers. So some people are more receptive to risk. Um, I think what the foreign exchange market did for me was the ability to deal with the degree of unknown unknowns, constant uncertainty, uh, left field activity coming at you all the time, and having to think on your feet and correct those decisions as rapidly as you are making them because the market is giving you that unknown environment all the time. So it creates a calmness of being able to cope in that kind of um, degree of movement and volatility. And if you take that back into business, it's actually thinking about what else could be there, what else could come from you, because you've got used to things coming from everywhere. I mean, we would have, I mean, I just think that the day Ronald Reagan was shot, did we expect that to happen? What did it do to the market? How did that impact little us in South Africa directly? So 
knowing that those impacts can infiltrate into business all the time, I think that creates a, a set of receptors that are open to that information. And I think part of it actually is in your DNA. So if you don't have it in your DNA in the first place, you probably wouldn't have ended up in the job I was in. So I think you're, there's this nature-nurture part of it that is in there. Um, if you don't have it, you would end up in a very different career. And thank goodness we're all different. Otherwise, we wouldn't have people you know, looking after the NHS, for example, if they're, they're all were like me. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, Rom. I hope I have. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting answer altogether. I'm sure we'll build on it over time. We've actually got another fascinating question as well as we work our way from all the way from family business to financial services and the FTSE 100 in between. So we've got a question from a LinkedIn user. What's one thing you wish you'd known when you started your career, Sharon? Oh, goodness. That is an interesting question. What do I think I'd known? Um, that is an interesting one. Um, I think what I would, what I wish I had known. I think if I had known the um, how how the market was going to change from a technology point of view, how globalization was going to change our opportunities, uh, the way technology has changed our world, if I could have foreseen carrying around my my. Um, desktop in those days, literally in a shopping cart, taking it home at night with the whole CPU and everything with me. Uh, if we'd known where things were going, we often talked about it. It was impossible to have imagined. So it would have been lovely to imagine that going forward. I think from um, the glass ceiling I had to deal with for so many decades in my life, I think it would have felt less frustrating dealing with that, knowing I was going to get through it and that you're going to get out the other side and would be treated as an equal with a brain. Um, that was that was a long journey to get through that. Um, and I think sort of if I look back and what would how would I mentor uh, young girls today coming into their, their careers is knowing there is no limitation. Whereas where I was brought up, if I'd known there was no limitation then, I think that feeling of I can do it more easily than I had to fight to do it, and I had to fight the environment around me to achieve it. I think that might have been one of the sort of, it would have been so much nicer not to have had that, that, that longer term initial battle. Interesting. Yes, it, it's quite fascinating how we, all, we can all look back with this 2020 hindsight and see the things that we probably realised. But most of the time it circles around opportunity and how we could have managed more of it if only we'd know it, known what was going to be there. And, and also, as you say, it's quite incredible when you think about this, you know, this device here. I mean, these, these incredible mm -hmm. things which you can do everything on, as you say. I mean, it can, it can actually process your business. It's your social media. It's your camera. It's everywhere you yeah. can. Well, yeah, I, I, actually, it's quite incredible because they've even built telephones into them these days. I mean, I mean, the limits of innovation. That's <laughs> where will it? Where will it all stop, ladies and gentlemen? Send us a message in the uh, in the feedback below. Tell us where you think technology could possibly reach before possibly even the end of the year, given the way that some of the things have been developing recently. So, okay, you had this first contact with the board. Then you actually sold out of your company and they said we love you but we don't want you to compete with us in the near future the ultimate compliment and you <laughs> took a few years you took a few years off to go and enjoy yourself and study and come back refreshed and what was it like when you came back to business were you really really hungry and and what was driving you at that stage I wouldn't say I was hungry. I was probably more um, bored, uh, brain starting to ferment. Um, I had dealt with a lot of big personal projects, renovations, um, family um, estates that needed run. So I'd used my brain for a good five, six, seven years while doing some traveling around the world and enjoying myself. Um, it also, yeah, there's more to life than being able to sit around. Not that I could do that for a single day of my life. So as these projects were evolving out, so the studies came in. And so I started looking at uh, technology as being a business career and started what today you would call an app, three of them. Uh, today I use one still. Um, they didn't make it to market. 2008 came, so my apps crashed and the market crashed. And everyone said, no, we do it on mainframes. 
I just think, goodness me, it took about being 12 years too soon in the world or 10 years too soon uh, for projects. So today we still use one of those applications, uh, but the others are pretty much dormant. Uh, that then led through that app to a governance world and the Walker Review um, came through in the financial services sector post the crash. And that was a natural place having left my own company because of bad governance, which is actually not that we understood the word governance truly in those words, where the board had ideas of doing something that the stakeholder called the customer was not going to appreciate. And I left over saying, you, I will not lead a company to deliver that to the customer. So on that basis, I'll leave the company and you go ahead and see if you can do it, which fortunately they never managed to achieve to um, hurt the customer in any way. So we achieved our ethical um, objective. But I think that probably gave me the um, the impetus for governance without realizing it. Um, so I got involved in the governance space and of working with boards and then working with people and realizing that actually the fundamental part of governance is not only the rules. That is absolutely part of it. It is the foundation of it. And one of those that you were talking about earlier where people are fighting against some of those governance requirements. But the other part of it is made up of human beings. And it's the human beings that you put around a table that creates dysfunction. And I sometimes blame the table. But I think more, more often than not, I should actually blame the people that are around it. So I spend a lot of my time helping individuals understand themselves, being mindful of others, and how they interact within a team because sometimes just those three things can be enough to help a board director be a much better director than they are currently. Very interesting. And actually, I'm going to introduce another question. We're going to, we're jumping around a bit this evening, but it's quite fascinating because we have another question from LinkedIn. And the question is, what is a lesson, Sharon, from your original secretarial job that you're still using today? <laughs> A lesson. Well, I'll talk, I'll answer slightly different. The one skill I still use is I can still type faster than anybody else I know. So I've still got that one and I can still write fast because I learned shorthand in those days. So those are the two skills I've brought with me. Um, what is the lesson I've learned there is, um, and this is going to sound really um, simple, but service with a smile. If you deliver things well, whatever's asked of you, and a secretary, you are in a, a position of delivery all the time. You're delivering to a boss, to a customer, to the company, whatever it might be. So you're in a system of um, making other people's lives better for you being there. And I think that's probably one thing I did enjoy about the role and something I've retained going through becoming a company secretary, becoming a company director, being a governance specialist is actually working with people and service with people and how to work with people. We call it influence today, how you can influence others to be their best. And a good secretary behind a seriously uh, competent executive was a very powerful role. And uh, if you look at today, company secretaries behind a board, it's much the same role as to what I had then. Do you think? I think that's a very good point. I mean, you look at that, that great sort of behind every great man, there's a great woman. Thing. <laughs> behind every I great never said that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think behind every great woman, there's quite often the vacuum, which is they're doing their own shorthand and being quite remarkable at, at, at many points in time. But um, it's, it's fascinating because obviously you've seen the whole gamut of what goes on. And therefore, You've also seen the whole gamut because you started your career in South Africa. You built an incredibly successful business. I mean, I should just point out, I, I do believe your, your original foreign exchange business, it went up 50 times on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Yeah. It was a very, very successful listing at its time in volatile times. But yes, it, was, it was great. <laughs> Eat Dirt Airbnb. You think you're doing really well this week. <laughs> The fascinating point about that, though, is, I mean, obviously, you then start from this very pale meal and stale environment in South Africa. Presumably, you knew lots about playing rugby, whether you liked it or not, in order to manage to interact with your non-executive directors, because they seem to have not a great deal else to say for themselves, uh, white South African men in their own homeland on occasion. But you saw the, the variation in relation to race. There was the apartheid 
situation, which was festering in the background. And therefore, we've got a great question has come in, which I think is quite fascinating. It comes to us today from, well, the wilds of the English countryside, from one Mr. Martin Watkins. <laughs> what advice do you have, Sharon, for Adina Friedman and NASDAQ in their drive? for greater diversity among the more than 3,000 companies that they have listed in NASDAQ from the USA, from China, from Israel, from right around the world? Persevere with, what, with the journey that you're on. The UK has been through that journey through um, Comply or Explain, through our governance codes. And there are statistics by various ranging from Bronfield to nothing to um, uh, oh, McKinsey and many others. I think Ned on boards have done it, uh, so have women on boards. There's been a lot of studies uh, around the top quartile performers and then looking at their boards. Now, which is the chicken and which is the egg will always be the question. But the companies that have got more diversity on the board and a good chairman who can manage that diversity, that I do state is an absolute requirement to go with diversity, they are showing better performance. Equally, they are including the ESG, the climate agenda, uh, the ethical uh, behavior, long-term sustainability, all those things are all part of those boards and those boards being successful and women, uh, gender, and other diversities, those that are visible and those that are not visible, being aspects that help create the quality conversation. Um, I know that they're, they're saying for NASDAQ that it's going to increase the cost and it's going to uh, decrease the profitability of businesses and it's going to bring all the wrong people in. I think there was a lot of that fighting back here in the UK back in 2012 onwards. But if you look at the outcome now of that journey that we have been on for eight, nine years, and you have got more women in, in the boardroom, the uh, group think has reduced and people are not passing decisions without challenging them, which they do more today generally in boardrooms than they ever did 15 years ago. So the outcome has been a better quality conversation. What we hope is that has delivered better decisions for the organization, but you don't get things being ramrolled through in the way you might have done 15 years ago here. Now, if I look at some of the sort of kickback that's coming from uh, the US on this one, it's actually quite antiquated to think that these are the things that are concerning them. When we've been through that whole journey and we do see that quotas are not nice, no, but sometimes you have to push. So do it without quotas. It's not mandatory, but you will have to find some other kinds of carrots uh, to help. And part of the work there I would recommend they do is go and win around the headhunters to broaden their market of reaching the women that are competent out there, you told them how many you've got on your mailing list alone, and get that diversity and maybe drive that not only from the nominations committees of those organizations from NASDAQ, but also probably through the headhunting world, which is where we've struggled in this country for, for so long, is to get that, that part of the industry finding the opportunities so that they feel they're still going to get the mandate, they're still going to get the job, they're going to get the gig, they're going to get the director position, and they find the right kind of people and the right kind of diversity. So we still struggle. It's interesting. I mean, actually, one of the things that, I mean, Adina Friedman was telling me last week about the whole proposal, which I found fascinating, is that NASDAQ are actually working with some organizations in the USA to build databases of qualified talent which I think is a great thing because actually then being able to show people that the talent is there. Yeah. But also one of the things that you, you mentioned this point, which just completely gasps my flabber at all points when it's said, which is whether it's correlation or whether it's causation, the truth is if you've got a more diversified board, your company tends to perform better. Your share price performs better. You make more money. You would think everybody, therefore, would be desperate for diversified boards in the first place, just in order to try and try that out, rather than going down the route of pale mail and stale, which we know is not the route to out performance. Yeah, we, we, we've got the evidence. So I would say to uh, the people on the other side of the pond, have a look at this side, have a look at our statistics, have a look at our top performing boards and understand what they've learned. Come come and talk to us. Come and talk to the uh, chairman 
of diverse boards and understand how they have learned over the eight years how much better those conversations are. And I've had Derek Chairman saying to me, I hated it. I didn't want it. I didn't know how to handle it. The conversation was so different. I didn't know. It, it was just so foreign to me. You speak to the same, same uh, chairman now, five years, eight years later, and they're saying, it is such a different place that we are actually engaging as a team of people rather than one person, one idea, all agree. Very, very interesting altogether. And also, let me just say at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, in between the fact that you've been bashing the like button, thank you very much. Don't forget, if you want to outperform in the exchange industry, I can offer you one very, very clear piece of statistical information, whether that's cor correlation, whether that's causation. Readers of Exchange Invest, their companies perform better as exchange operators than the rest of the operations in the world of bourses. So, Sharon, you have gone on this fascinating journey that has brought you ultimately to, I mean, in one way, the heart of the city of London. So you are, if I remember correctly, on the court of the Worshipful Company of Corporate Secretaries. Is that correct? Company Secretaries and Administrators. We've still got the old name. But yes, I'm on the court and I am chairman of the membership committee. And part of my remit is I don't have to worry about gender diversity, but I do have to worry about age diversity. Now, that's another interesting question, because it's something that we don't see mandated a great deal is age diversity. When do you think is, is I mean, given the way that the UK boards are also structured, given the fact that pretty much after eight years, you're seen as or six years, you're no longer seen as being independent anyway. What's the situation in terms of how you maintain a decent mix between all of these positions because you've got age you've got gender and then you've also got the issue of minority rights and so on how, how does one balance that effectively well i think one of the ways of bringing in age at the moment is through the digital agenda uh, most companies need some form of upskilling at the board level definitely of digitalization and uh, transformation and culture change those kind of things are important for companies to actually be relevant going forward uh, into the this, this decade that we're in at the moment. So that is one way of bringing age in. And one of the things that uh, is always useful for a board is to have an acting CEO, or acting finance director, chief, a C-suite individual on a board where they have a NED role as well as their full-time exec role, which allows them to come onto the NED portfolio rungs in their 40s, potentially some even in their late 30s, which gives them better experience in a board environment to improve their own understanding as an exec in their own role, but also gives them the ability to start understanding the role of the NED world so that they then, after their six to nine years, max nine years, they then are rolling onto another board or another trust role or something like that. So they're doing that to complement their full-time job because you're not going to survive on a net salary most of the time as a single salary. You might have to do a portfolio of net jobs. So it gives somebody the ability to move from an exec to a portfolio much easier by having been a net in their exec time period. So that is an encouragement is for the, the talent hunting process of the nominations committee to look for the executives that are up there and get them onto the board. And then you roll that age group through either culture, transformation, digital, whatever it is, and that helps. So, but that's only one I've alluded to, but I think that probably covers your question. Oh, no, that's a, that's a great start. We can't possibly manage comprehensivity in the course of one hour, but it's really, it's really good to touch so many bases, Sharon. And we've got a super question coming from the international community who are trying to help one of many, the ladies throughout the world, women on it, who are in the process of always pursuing the agenda for diversity. Great question there. Is one woman or minority enough, or do we need to make... A board work, does it really have to have more people? My first non-exec role in financial services, I was the token woman. So I've been in that situation where I was there because they had to have a woman. So they chose somebody local to the organization and a female. And I had financial service experience, so I had the relevant experience, but I didn't have the, the direct niche of that part of the financial services sector. And it was almost impossible to make a real change as one voice of diversity 
and one voice that was different. And I've seen through my board evaluation work that I do that bringing on one woman, one ethnic person, one young person, one digital person, one non-industry person, whatever diversity it might be, is that person is shunned more likely than they are absorbed and um, encompassed into the team. So we recommend that when you are going to go for diversity, it might not be all the same diversity, but if you're going to bring in diversity, you need three. A third of the board should have a difference to the rest. Um, and so that will allow the conversation to be broader. No one person then is victimized in the process of being different and therefore you are not good enough because that is the direct correlation. And you do find that society, and this has been uh, tested as well um, when I, I, I um, lecture for uh, boardroom dynamics. And one of the um, case studies is around a policewoman who was uh, held up or was uh, had done something wrong and she went through a disciplinary process. A man did exactly the same thing, went through the disciplinary process. She lost her job, he didn't, and they did exactly the same thing wrong. Women are treated far more harshly in this world. I don't know about other diversities. I don't have any stats in it, but I would guess it's fairly similar. So as soon as somebody is different, they are shunned and they, their lives are made an absolute misery in a boardroom environment because they are not listened to and they've got so much value to bring. So to the person who's asked the question, you do need a third of the diversities together at least to be able to make a difference to the real culture in that environment so that you are heard, that your content is, is, is understood and the fight becomes less. If you're going to have one third of those people, I suppose that raises then an interesting issue we skirted around earlier. Thank you very much for that great question, woman on IT. What is the actual ideal size of a board? <laughs> If you look at the standard structure of a board, the standard committees that we have today, and your norm, and I say that in inverted commas, of two executive directors plus your chairman, and then you've got four non-executive directors. So seven in a larger company, financial services, listed, regulated, whatever it might be, seven is your bottom end for effectiveness uh, of being able to cover all the duties of that board. Um, and you do find a lot of companies, the smaller end, obviously, are much lower. Um, but you need to retain, need to contain the executive involvement because the minute you've got your two execs plus your chairman, you now need one more independent person than the sum of those. So you're into the four. So you don't want to go higher. I mean, I think the stats say it's between seven and 11 is your ideal number. So too many voices is chaos. It's like an orchestra that's too big and people can't actually manage it. So it does require good chairmanship to manage the larger, any number of board, any number of people, but the larger, the more difficult because conversations can go AWOL quite easily. So it is important to um, have relevant people as well as numbers and the right numbers and the right alignment to your strategy because then those conversations will be diverse, but they will be pointed in the right direction. So I'd say somewhere between seven and nine. Seven and nine, okay, that's a, that's a very useful number. I think it's quite interesting, particularly given the fact that some companies in the parish of exchanges could have three companies just made out of their current board of directors on that basis. One case, it could have even have a few spares just as reserves for other committees, I suppose, if things weren't going quite right. So. If we're looking at that, we're into our last five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. If anybody has a final question, please read this. feel free to give us your input right at this juncture. Ask or forever hold your peace until January when we're going to be returning. So, Sharon, very interesting when you're looking at board diversity, board structure. You've seen so many things during the course of your time and also obviously with your understanding as a, as a corporate secretary, etc. How best can you manage to make a board function between asking difficult questions, being somewhat, I don't know, corporately raunchy in terms of how you want to shake things up, and actually observing the status quo so you're not overly upsetting the executive? You need someone in a board that's almost like the spanner in the works, um, somebody who will say, hold on, stop, I, I don't, why are we going this way? What is the reason? What's the history? Without wanting the boardroom to be the lesson room, 
because that you don't ask questions to learn. You ask questions because you genuinely want people to think things through. So if you want to learn, you go and do that before the board meeting or after the board meeting. So you do need people to stretch. So it's to ask, what was your logic? Where did you come from? Why did you think that way? What do you think the outcome might be? You're there to ask the questions to get the other people to think. You're not judging them, being personally critical or any of those uh, sort of uncomfortable um, behaviors that you do tend to see quite often in a boardroom. So you are asking people in a supportive way, bringing your knowledge, but not directing and not teaching and not um, sort of treating them like a parent-child environment. You don't ever want those kind of things to do. So it's just getting them to think more laterally at that point on a specific topic is what you're there to do, using your knowledge and your EQ and your ability to communicate uh, to get people to think further than they might have. Because the more they think further, the more they can potentially take the business further which is what you're looking to do, and also to protect against risk, to do the right things, make the right decisions. So I think I've answered your question. Um, if there's a part of it I haven't, please rephrase it. I think that's great. I think that's really, really useful. And I think what I would like to therefore ask you, as we've only got a couple of minutes left, is a final question this evening. You've deployed your IQ, you've deployed your EQ, you've talked to us about perseverance, and much more besides. What's next? for Sharon Constanson. What do you see coming to the next stage of your exciting journey? Or what would you like to see happen in your exciting oh, thank journey? Thank you. Um, I, I feel at this stage sort of really at, uh, I wish I'd been able to be at this stage of my career 20 years younger, but given my South African and female environment, I am at it 20 years later than I might have been. But the energy to take that into a more plural net career, which is taking my executive experience, being at the cutting edge of governance, being at the cutting edge of the foreign exchange risk markets at the moment. And we are seeing our volatility plenty at the moment. And to take that value and that EQ, IQ um, ability for risk into a plural net career at a level where I can really give back. Now, I know they were saying they can't find women. Uh, that's quite interesting. But the area where the more complex, the the more difficult the environment, the more challenging I will find it. And the more I think I'll be able to see through the noise and be able to add that value. So, yes, I'm looking for um, moving from my existing chairman role uh, that will run out in uh, three to four years time. So dovetailing that, I could potentially stop at the six years or as, as a chairman, move on, depending on what the organization needs. I don't believe you should stay there until you become stale. Um, so it's taking the bringing in the parallels alongside that. So you've got the streamlined movement into a plural ongoing NED career. Uh, that I have now, um, I would like to see that just being in organizations where I think I can bring more value than I do to the smaller organizations. So, Sharon, what's the 100 would do? Financial services would do. What, what an elegant concept. Or indeed, NASDAQ 100, that would do as well. Oh. I'm sure, if you Actually, could. I don't know if I could deal with the Americans having the chairman and the CEO in one person. No, I think I'd go mad. Every so often they split up the role of chairman and CEO at one or two companies. It happens on occasion. But, uh, yes, interesting, the diversity of corporate governance across the Atlantic, a whole topic for another show. Sharon Constanson, thank you very, very much. It has been wonderful to listen to you today, de deploying your IQ, your EQ. I have to say, listening to your early story, I think we were all sitting there humming It's a Hard Knock Life from the musical Annie. <laughs> It round. I mean, you took yourself out there, you went into the foreign exchange market, you foresaw the great collapse crashes, all of the things that preceded the Plaza Accord of 1985. It was an incredible moment in your career because it gave you so much understanding of risk. And you've been talking about how to be intuitive and understand both what are the prospects for the tides, where are the tides, and indeed, is it possible that you're currently standing on an empty beach because there has, in fact, been a tsunami which is about to wash over you. All of the above, I think, are fascinating, of course, perhaps learned from your origins close to the beaches, the beautiful beaches of Cape Town in South Africa. Yeah. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be pretty much a wrap for our show for this year. All I have to say is, of course, during the course of the next couple of weeks, we won't be around. So therefore, you may be wondering how you can possibly understand what's going on in the ongoing negotiations between the European Union and the UK over Brexit, which, of course, could be described as, well, a particularly vicious divorce of the First Order. For those of you who perceive the European Union as somewhat of a flawed game show concept, with admittedly the protagonists having worse hair and teeth, having said that, I think President von der Leyen has certainly added a layer of sophistication that has previously been missing in the pale nail and steel protagonists of the presidency of the European Union. It seems to be that we're not at that game show. We're going to be benchmarking deal or no deal on Brexit for the course of the next couple of weeks. So don't be surprised to see the usual operatic climax for the chorus at the very end of December 31st, when presumably we'll be allowed to call upon a fat lady if we're allowed to indeed call ladies fat at that juncture, because of course we could indeed impinge upon many different European Union ordinances. But the essential sticking point to remember, ladies and gentlemen, is just one of simple dictionary definitions. In the United Kingdom, the people think sovereignty means they're being in control of governing their own nation. In Brussels, they think UK sovereignty means the European Union is in control of the United Kingdom's government. We're going to return on January the 12th, ladies and gentlemen. Mark Mitpeace, the man who made FTSE. For now, if you're watching in America and you're undoubtedly imbued with the incredibly politically correct... Well, let me wish you all a very happy Christmas. If you're watching in the rest of the world, I wish you all a very happy Christmas too. Happy Hanukkah if you're in the last couple of days of celebrating that. Most importantly of all, we're going to return in 2021 and it's going to be a peaceful, prosperous and above all happy 2021. Hopefully seeing the end of the wonderful, incredibly amazing year that has been 2020 that has been blighted by COVID. Thank you very much to Ola, to Beata, to the entire production team and everybody at Exchange Invest. Don't forget, drop by exchangeinvest.com. You too can qualify for a free trial if you want to know all about what's best in the divorce business and ultimately benchmarking the happenings in the world of exchanges. From myself and this evening's fantastic guest, Sharon, Sharon Constanson. My name is Patrick L. Young. Happy New Year, ladies and gentlemen. Overnight. <laughs>